ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Indeed all praise and thanks are due to Allah we praise him we seek his assistance and we seek his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our actions whosoever Allah guides then there is none that can lead him astray and whosoever Allah leaves to go astray then none can guide him and i bear witness that none has the right to be worshiped except allah alone having no partners and i bear witness that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his slave and messenger o you who believe fear allah as he should be feared and die not to accept in a state of islam with complete submission to allah o mankind be dutiful to your lord who created you from a single person and from him he created his wife and from them both he created many men and women and fear Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights and do not cut the relations of the wombs surely Allah is ever an all watcher over you O you who believe keep your duty to Allah and fear him and speak always the truth he will direct you to do righteous good deeds and will forgive you your sins and whosoever obeys Allah and his messenger he has indeed achieved a great achievement to proceed indeed the best speech is the book of Allah and the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the worst of affairs are the newly invented matters and every newly invented matter is an innovation and every innovation is misguidance and every misguidance is in the hellfire our brothers and sisters nobody in this country is now unaware of the events of the past week of the past few days the killing of a, a soldier in Woolwich and the the apparent perpetrators of this killing claiming that they were doing this act in the name of Islam and the ongoing media attack which has become uh, which has come from that upon Islam blaming radical Islam as they call it for these kinds of actions my brothers and sisters it's upon every muslim and as many muslim organizations have done to free themselves from this kind of thing being attached to and being um, sort of associated to islam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in surah al-anfal surah number 8 verse 58 inna allah la yuhibbul khainin that certainly allah does not like or does not love the treacherous people so Uh, this ayah of the Quran the, the Mufassir Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, he said about this ayah that this even includes treachery against disbelievers Imam Ahmad recorded that Salim Ibn Amir said Mu'awiyah radiallahu anhu was leading an army in the Roman lands at a time when there was a bilateral peace treaty which was valid he wanted to go closer to their forces so when the peace treaty ended he could immediately invade them an old man riding on his animal went past him and said allahu akbar allahu akbar be honest and stay away from betrayal the message of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said whoever has a treaty of peace with a people 
then he should not untie any part of it or tie it harder until the treaty reaches its, reaches its appointed term. Or he should declare the treaty null and void so that they are both on equal terms. When Muawiyah an was in, informed of the statement of the Prophet wasallam, he retreated. Then they found that man, the old man on the animal, to be Amr ibn Anbasa radiallahu anhu. And this hadith was also collected by Abu Dawood, um, Tirmidhi, Nasai, and Ibn Hibban in his Sahih. So my brothers and sisters, as the scholars have explained, the scholars who are true scholars of Islam, that us Muslims, that we are living in this country, we are living here under a contractual agreement with the state that we are living in. We live here, we have certain benefits that we get by living here from this contractual agreement that we have with the host country, with our country that we're living in. In the same vein, therefore, we have certain obligations and certain responsibilities towards this agreement. So on one hand, we want the benefits. We want, when we become ill, the NHS treats us for free. We want, when somebody smashes our windows, when somebody smashes our car, we want the police to come and investigate that for free. We want when something happens and we need a fire service, that the fire service comes and they come and they do their work for us for free. We, we demand all of these services. We want our roads cleaned. We want the streets cleaned. We want our rubbish taken away. In one hand, we want all of these things. So on the other hand, we have a contractual obligation that we give back by being citizens of this country. And this is something that's not against Islam at all. Because there have been many peace treaties throughout the history of Islam with non-Muslim nations, with non-Muslim nations who have attacked the Muslims in many different uh, circumstances. Even in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was Sulah Hudaybiyah. Some of the Sahaba, they couldn't understand why the Prophet ﷺ was making such an agreement. But they had to abide by that agreement. And later on, the fruits of this action of abiding by agreements, they became apparent later on. The doors for people entering into Islam were opened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthened the Muslims. If we become a treacherous people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He doesn't love treacherous people. You can't be a person who's going around ma making an agreement on the face of it, demanding your bits from that agreement, demanding benefits, demanding whatever you, else you're demanding, and then at the same time, then you commit such acts of treachery. Now I'm not saying that this, what's been shown to us on the media, is the 100% truth. Allah knows best and we wait for somebody to come and investigate properly what happened. Because it's becoming all too common that people who nobody really knows, people who yesterday they were non-Muslims, today they come and they do something stupid and then they start saying Allahu Akbar. And they start saying I've done this for Islam. You have to wonder whether there's something else going on. Because it seems that just when Islam was picking up in this country, people are entering into Islam, then in, on the other hand, the, all these kind of actions start to happen, which make the, anybody turn against a religion that, does, that calls for this kind of thing. Nobody wants to be part of a religion that is such a treacherous religion that nobody knows when they're safe and when they're not safe. And this is something that's totally harming the dawah efforts. So you have to wonder who is in reality behind all of this thing. But as we say, this is something that we don't know, we don't even have the power to investigate, so it's better that we don't make any uh, bold statements on either side of the thing. The reality of the matter is that Islam is totally free of treacherous actions, Islam is totally free of uh, you know, unjustified extrajudicial killings of people. If it's left up to every single person to decide who lives and who dies, if Islam was such a religion, then it would have led to total chaos. Anybody can just get up and decide that you are not worth living anymore and they can come and kill you as well. And we wouldn't accept this. No, no Muslim would ever accept this and no Muslim scholar has ever accepted this. Imam Qurtubi rahimahullah, he said, kind treatment, the kind treatment of neighbors is enjoined and is recommended whether they are Muslim or not. And this is the right thing to do. Kind treatment may be in the sense of helping, or it may be in the sense of being kind to people, refraining from annoyance 
and standing by them. Imam Bukhari narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jibreel kept urging me to treat neighbors kindly until I thought that he would make them heirs, meaning that they would inherit. And it was narrated from Abu Shuray that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, By Allah he does not believe. By Allah he does not believe. By Allah he does not believe. So it was said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, who is that? He said, the one whose neighbor is not safe from his annoyance. So Imam Qurtubi continues and says, this is general in meaning and applies to all neighbors. And the Prophet ﷺ affirmed that the neighbor should not be annoyed by swearing three times and stating that the one who annoys his neighbor is not a believer in the complete sense. So the believer should avoid annoying his neighbor and refrain from doing what Allah and His Messenger have forbidden. He should strive to do that which pleases him and encourage others to do likewise. So my brothers and sisters, this point really needs to be hammered home because there's too much confusion in our community about these kind of affairs. And this has all stemmed from one real issue. And the issue is that our society, that the way that we came into this country, the way that mosques were established here, the way that our communities established themselves here, has led to a way where our community is disconnected from true Islamic knowledge. Our communities have sort of, you know, just made do, just got by with whatever they can, and they've let in any, any nut who's got his own theory, can come along, he can find an audience, people will just start listening to him, and you know, he can start going around getting a following. What is obligatory on every single one of us is to gain knowledge of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in a Sahih Hadith in Ibn Majah, the طَلَبُ الْإِلْمِ فَرِيدَةٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ That seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. And this is so that when you live your life, especially as a Muslim living in a non-Muslim land, we are, whether we like it or not, we are always under the microscope. Every action that we do is scrutinized. Every time you do an action, whether you realize it or not, when you're out shopping, when you behave in a certain way, the person that you're interacting with will remember that this was a Muslim. If you behave in an honorable, decent way, where you don't do any treachery, you are honest in your interactions, the people will remember that this was a Muslim that I dealt with, and the Muslim, when I gave him five pence extra change, he was concerned about that, and he gave back the five pence extra change. If, however, the Muslim, he comes into the shop, he pulls out a knife and stabs the person, then that people are going to associate Islam with what you've done. Because of the fact that we, we all represent our religion here. And this is something that the scholars have said from the beginning of Islam that you need to have knowledge about how to go about with your interactions with people. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, he said in uh, Hassan hadith which is narrated by Imam Tirmidhi and graded Hassan by Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah, that no one should sell in the marketplace except those who have knowledge of Islam. That even if you're going to go into buying and selling, then you need to learn a level of knowledge so that you know how to behave as a Muslim and how a Muslim buys and sells. And buying and selling is a small thing, my brothers and sisters. Shedding blood is a great, humongous thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran that someone who unjustly kills someone, it's as if he had killed the whole of mankind. And on the converse side, that if somebody saves someone's life, it's as if they had saved the whole of mankind. And these issues are just treated by some people as if they're not important. That as if killing is, is even less important than buying and selling. So if Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an is saying that you need to have Islamic knowledge before you even enter the marketplace to trade, then it's even more important that you gain Islamic knowledge before you start talking about affairs which lead to bloodshed and corruption and lack of safety for everybody. I've said a few times before, I think my last two khutbahs, I said the same thing. That Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said in Majmool Fatawa, that in a time when, a, when the Muslim community is weak, or in an area where the Muslim community is weak, if, um, if a non-Muslim kills, if, if a Muslim kills a non-Muslim, then he is more sinful than even if he'd killed a Muslim. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he explained the reason behind this. And Ibn Taymiyyah was a government sellout scholar. Ibn Taymiyyah went through humongous hardships and humongous trials in his life. Ibn Taymiyyah went through big turmoil. 
the Muslim Empire was at its weakest. Lands were being invaded by the Tatars. Invasions were going on. People were, Muslims were getting killed left, right and center. Similar situation to what we're living in now. And Ibn Taymiyyah said this at that time. That if a Muslim in a state of weakness, he kills a non-Muslim, then he is more sinful than if he had killed a believer. And the reason for that is because when the one Muslim kills a non-Muslim, then the non-Muslims will take that as an excuse and they will kill 20 Muslims. And then Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, he said, the sin of the 20 dead Muslims is upon that Muslim who killed a non-Muslim to begin with. Because as Muslims, we believe in the asbab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. There are things which are above the asbab and there are things which are below the asbab. And this is one of the things which is below the asbab, that your actions have consequences. When we do an action, we have to look at the action in the balance of the scales of Islamic knowledge. We can't just go out and just do any action that comes to our mind and then say that I'm not, I've got nothing to do with the consequences. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that don't revile their gods because they'll revile your God. Your God. And the Prophet wasallam said that don't revile other people's parents because they will revile your parents. So this shows that if you do an action and the consequence is something bad, then you are responsible for the bad consequence as well. So in the same way, my brothers and sisters, when people behave in an immature, angry manner where they don't even have the knowledge of what they're doing, why they're doing it, they lead to more harm and more evil. And already we're beginning to see that. As from what I heard again, I haven't seen this myself, but what I've heard is one mosque was petrol bombed in London. Another mosque, a man entered the mosque with a knife and the police had to be called. Today I received a text message that a sister in Fulham in London wearing niqab was walking down the street and somebody came up to her and physically assaulted her, took her niqab and her hijab off her head. And she had to run and find safety somewhere. All of these actions that are happening, they, are less, they rest at the doors of those people that killed that soldier yesterday, the other day. This is the law of consequences. When you revile somebody's gods and they revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are responsible and you get the sin for them reviling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the same way, when you revile someone else's parents and they revile your own parents, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa likened that to you being the one reviling your own parents. So in the same way, when people do actions and those actions cause harm to innocent Muslims, then that person that did that action, he is the one responsible for everything that happens. That doesn't take away responsibility from the people that did the evil actions themselves, but the responsibility is equally upon the head of the person who causes the fitna in the first place. It's very easy for brothers, especially, you know, if you're big, you're tall, you're strong, you can go around and act like the hard man. But when it's the old man like Uncle Salim, that's the person who's going to end up getting stabbed because of the hatred that you've been fostering. It's going to be a sister who's out with her children in a pram and she's the one that's going to get attacked. You're not going to have to be there and face the consequences. Ali radiallahu an, he also said the same thing about trade. He said whoever engages in trade before learning the Islamic knowledge will fall into riba and fall into riba. So it shows us again and again that people who enter into affairs that are beyond them, without having the usul about them, without having Islamic knowledge about them, then they will fall into errors and they'll fall into errors again and again and again. And they'll lead themselves and other people towards destruction. And beyond that, that's something that we need to bear in mind for ourselves. But we also need to bear in mind that we are living in this country now and we are behaving as a very immature society. Other, other communities have moved into this country and they have engaged in a much more positive way with the system of this country so that they are not made scapegoats every time something happens. The media has, has a big role to play in portraying actions as one thing or another. You know, if one community, somebody mad from one community does something, they don't blame the rest of the community. But if a mad Muslim does something, then the first headlines that will come out the next day, there will be, you know, there will be the words Islamist or Islamic fanatic, etc., etc. All kinds of uh, associations are made with Islam. And one example um, of the double standards that the media has with regards to that is Anders Breivik in 2011, when he killed a scores of people 
they never once called him a terrorist. Why? Because he was a white, blonde, Western person. And he was, you know, he, he was there promoting their ideology in a sense. But not once did the word terrorism get used. Not once was his religion blamed. And no one else had to go around answering questions or go around and face backlashes like the Muslims have to. So this shows that whether we like it or we don't like it, the media has a huge influence and a huge power over the 60 million people that live in this country. So as Muslims now, we need to start engaging with that media. We need to start having influence on them. So that when these things happen for the sake of our elders, for the sake of our children and our sisters who are the ones that get attacked, that we need to start lessening the harm in every way that we can. And the other thing that I want to say to my brothers and sisters is that now when things happen, you have to, as the Prophet ﷺ told one of the Sahaba, that you have to tie your camel first and then trust in Allah. You don't just say we're just trusting Allah and we're not going to take any means to protect ourselves. Islam, we believe in Qadr, but we also believe in something called Asbab, which are the, the ways and the means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes things to happen. There are things which the scholars have said are focal asbab, which are above the means. You have no, you have no say over them. So if you're walking down the street and a, it's a windy day and a branch falls on you and kills you, you know, that's something that's probably focal asbab. You couldn't really have done anything about that yourself. The only thing you can do there is do your azkar in the morning. You can pray to Allah ta'ala to protect you. However, when there's things which are folk, uh, uh, tahtal asbab, they're below the means, then those things are things that you have some control over. So those kind of things, it's important for a Muslim that he takes those things. For example, somebody might say, I'm hungry, I'm going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for food to feed me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the food, but you have to pick it up and you have to put it in your mouth yourself. Your belly is not going to get full itself just because you're sitting there saying, I'll trust in Allah to do this. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the ways and the means. So in the same way for us, it's very important to be vigilant now. You know, to be vigilant about our masajid, to be vigilant about our family members, to be vigilant about our community members. The brothers and sisters, when you're out and about, don't become the next statistic. Don't become the next victim. Think about where you're going. Think about how you're getting there. Think about who's around you. You know, think about the route that you're going to take because we know very, very well the, for example, one of the negative um, things from this attack has been that on Tuesday, the number of people liking the ED, EDL's Facebook page was something like 28,000. Today it's jumped up to 100,000. So this, you know, this number of the hatred in this society because of these actions has increased and there are many hotheads in this society who are just looking for any excuse to attack people and they've just now found the perfect excuse. And from uh, DAO organizations in London that I've been reading messages from, that there have been a spate of violent attacks on Muslims over the last few days. So my brothers and sisters, watch out for each other. Watch out for your parents. Watch out for your elders. Watch out for the sisters. Watch out for the children as well. And we need to start to think seriously as a community that these problems, they're not just going to go away if we ignore them. We all need to gather around our scholars. One of the things that Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan, Hafizullah, he said about in interviews after a number of terrorist attacks. He said that if you look at the people that carry out these kind of actions that cause fitna for everybody, then these people, you'll never really find them having studied classical Islamic knowledge with any scholar. There will only be people who, they'll, they'll know a little bit from here, they'll know a little bit from there, they'll have started doing their own uh, reading, they'll have started just making their own ideas, they'll have even borrowed ideas from other societies, from other works or from journalists rather than scholars and they'll, they'll make their whole methodology based upon that. So it's important my brothers and sisters, I can't stress this enough, that we need to take our Islamic knowledge and make it stronger and we need to do that by learning from the ulama. And we do have qualified ulama in this country. There's this, um, this divisive kind of uh, ideology out there that the ulama that are in this country that have graduated from Medina, such as Sheikh Abdul Hadi, Hafizullah, that these people shouldn't be learnt from for one reason or another reason. These are bona fide scholars. If they were in another country, people would be respecting them a lot more than we respect them in our own country. And if we learn our religion from them, not only 
would the likelihood of stupid actions happening go down, but we ourselves would be more equipped to deal with how things fall out, how things uh, seem to roll out in the society that is around us. I'm going to stop there, inshallah. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد. Last time, brothers and sisters, last time we talked about the killing of Uncle Salim, رحمه الله. The the police were here earlier, and this is something that is a, is some kind of sensible person should look at this. That they, you know, if you're making out these assumptions and this this sort of view that the, the, the police are against us, the police are the ones who are going around trying to find who killed Uncle Salim. Today they've been down to the masjid and they've given leaflets and some of them are outside asking for further information and also some, there's been a reward of, a, <coughs> of 10,000 pounds for any information as well. And this is something that, you know, should be a watershed moment for our society. I remember speaking to one of the scholars, Sheikh Musiullah, from Makkah after that happened. And the Sheikh said that as you people, as a community, you need to make sure that this event is not just forgotten about. This should, be, this should cause a change in your own behavior and in your own actions. That you realize that you know, you, the way you've been working in this country hasn't been conducive to your, to your own good. And that you start to take sensible actions to protect yourselves, to protect your elders, to make a society where you're not going to be threatened like this, and where, you can do, where we can do our Islamic work in a better way. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما بركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا ذا بالنار أقيم الصلاة